Okay, I think it's starting to slow down. I think we'll go ahead and get going. Uh, thank you everybody for attending and welcome to uh, the 2020 version of the Acadia National Park Science Symposium. Uh, my name is Abe Miller Rushing. I'm the science coordinator here at Acadia National Park. Um, this is one of my very favorite days of the year, um, but of course uh, this year is, is different um, in lots and lots of ways. Um, and, uh, but as always, we can't really express how much we appreciate uh, all that you guys do uh, to support science in Acadia um, and elsewhere. Um, and I know that this year um, is harder for a lot of folks, uh, for pretty much all of us uh, right now. And I really hope that uh, all you and your families are, uh, are healthy and, and doing okay right now. Um, giving, uh, Given the circumstances this year, we're doing things a little bit differently. Uh, today is a chance for us, um, you know, normally we're gathering in person and we do the whole symposium in one day. Uh, this year, we're gonna be splitting it up over several days. Today is a session is a chance for us all to check in, get a small snapshot of where we are as a community. And to remember that we are a community, the science community of Acadia, um, even if we're physically isolated uh, a lot of the time this year. And based on your responses to the survey, as you were registering, uh, we're going to plan a series of mini symposia um, and discussions that'll start in early 2021. Um, and before we get going, I'm gonna just go through a couple of housekeeping things. Um, we're recording the science symposium today uh, so that for people who couldn't make it uh, so that they can watch it later. Um, so just keep that in mind. Please keep yourself muted um, unless you're called on to ask questions. Um, uh, you can use your camera. You're welcome to use your camera if you like. It's totally up to you. Um, uh, if you're having trouble with bandwidth, you might cut off the, the video feed. Um, but, but I think in a lot of ways, it's nice to be able to see everybody, but it's totally your call. And during this symposium, we encourage you to use the chat to ask questions um, all throughout, like as, you, as the questions are occurring to you, don't just hold on to them. Uh, the speakers and organizers will answer them as we can, or we can, we'll call on you at different times after each of the talks, or there will be also a discussion at the end where we can address some of the questions. So please do use the chat um, lots. Um, and with that, I'm going to introduce, I'm going to hand it over to Kevin Schneider, uh, the superintendent of Acadia, uh, to give uh, some welcoming remarks. Thanks, Abe. This, this might come as a surprise in some respects, but I, I, I think that 2020 really has been the year for science, especially because of the COVID, COVID pandemic. And, and it's especially the year for science communication. Uh, the, the COVID pandemic, make no mistake, is a terrible, terrible thing. But I think we can all learn from it. Uh, confronting it, uh, whether it's developing a vaccine or better treatment, is this massive, wide world, massive worldwide scientific conundrum. And with this, it's really brought science communication into conversations around America's dinner table. Uh, most of you, I am guessing, have heard of Dr. Nirav Shah. If you live in Maine and you haven't heard of Dr. Shah, I think you must have been living under a rock for the last seven months, or you've done a really good job of, of being socially distant. One could even say isolated. Uh, Dr. Shah is the director of the Maine Center for Disease Control, for those who don't know him. And he's become a, a, a very popular figure in the state. Um, I, I'd like to encourage all of you, uh, everyone in this, in this Zoom room, to study Dr. Shaw, you know, to tune into some of his press conferences and really listen to what he's saying. But when you listen to him, I want you to listen with a, a really different objective, not necessarily to the substance of what he says, but how he says it. Uh, and, and, and now, why is this relevant to a science workshop here at Acadia? This is epidemiology, public health. We're, we're in the natural resource business, the cultural resource business, the visitor use management business. Well, Dr. Shaw is a master of science communication. 
I think he's done an incredible job of translating really technical, abstract, and sometimes arcane epidemiological data um, and translating it into words that a broader public can understand. He's a master at the use of metaphor to help get his point across. He has connected with the public and built trust. Um, he doesn't come across as though he's talking down to people. He exudes competence and credibility. And more broadly, the COVID pandemic has really shown the importance of good science communication. And while our work collectively may not be in medicine or epidemiology or public health, we can learn a lot from this community. The best doctors are the ones that can connect with their patients and communicate with them. And so I would tell you that more than half of your job as a scientist is to actually be a good science communicator. You can have the greatest science in the world, but if you can't explain it to your mother-in-law in the elevator, then you've missed the boat. Uh, in order for us to confront these incredibly difficult challenges and make decisions that are scientifically informed, we need to be as good as Dr. Shaw. We need you to communicate your science so that people who don't read the Journal of Applied Ecology can actually benefit from, from your work. And so that's why symposia like this are so important. They give us the opportunity to come together as a community and talk to one another and to see how our messages resonate. And so thank you for participating in the first ever online science symposium. I wanna recognize and thank some of our most critical partners that help get science done here in Acadia National Park. Uh, Skudik Institute, Friends of Acadia, Maine Coast Heritage Trust, the University of Maine, College of the Atlantic, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the state and its agencies. We very much appreciate all of these partners that come together to help us make good science-informed decisions here at Acadia National Park, which is absolutely critical to what we do. Thanks too to Emma Albee, who's uh, from Skudik Institute, who has done a ton of work in pulling together uh, the science symposium. So Emma, thank you for everything you've done. And we also couldn't have done it without Nick Fisichelli, the president and CEO of Scudic Institute. And so now I, I'd like to hand it off to, to Nick to also make a few introductory remarks. So let's give uh, Nick a big round of Zoom applause and, uh, and welcome Nick. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, and hi, everybody. And, and uh, I would echo what, what Kevin said. Big thank you to, to lots of folks for, for making today happen to Abe Miller-Rushing, uh, who you've heard from already, to Catherine Schmidt uh, at Scudic, to Emma Albee, Becky Colwill, and, and others for planning the symposium today. And, and today, this the Acadia Science Symposium, unlike any other uh, Acadia Science Symposium. It is, of course, a time for us to come together as a science community, as the Acadia Science Community, uh, normally to connect face-to-face -face during the poster sessions, to, stroll over to Schooner Commons together to have lunch, uh, maybe to sneak out to Little Moose Island in the afternoon, of course, after the, the conference was, was completed. Uh, and, and this year is, is different. Uh, and you know, COVID-19 has been a challenge and, and in some ways an, an opportunity as well. And this is true for all of us on both personal and, and professional levels as, as, as scientists and, and managers. Um, and you know, for, for me on a, on a personal level, COVID has put a, a lens on, on being a scientist that I, I perhaps don't often think about or, or appreciate. And, and this big piece was, was about observing nature, uh, studying nature and, and how, how that's been so grounding uh, for me, especially in these, these unprecedented times. Nature is, is sort of a, has been a tether uh, as so many other things uh, have gotten turned on their heads. And you know, all the while during the pandemic, nature has continued. Um, <clears throat> in the spring from the, the first uh, wildflowers coming out to the first leaves unfurling, such as in, in the slide here, uh, to the neotropical migrant birds arriving back uh, from their overwintering grounds. And, and to now, again, the changing of leaf color, the birds turning around and, and heading back south. Nature has continued on and, and showed us that adapting to change uh, is, that, is exactly what nature is all about. 
All right, pop quiz for any any uh, nature nerds in in the audience here. What plant is this? You can can put it in the chat. Um, and if you think you know this plant, this is a tough one, I think, because it's just uh, breaking bud right now, so not easy to tell. But uh, feel free to to uh, put an answer in in the chat. Um, so so that's sort of on a, on a personal level and on a professional level. Uh, COVID has brought both you know, serious challenges, uh, tremendous challenges, but also opportunities to, to our work. And, and as, as Kevin mentioned, it's, it's put a lens or a spotlight on, on the importance of science and, and science communication. And, and, and I agree, Dr. Shah is somebody to definitely listen to, not just for what he's saying, but how he's saying it. He's just a, a tremendous communicator. Um, and, and for our science, I think you know, the spotlight has, has been on, on national parks as ideal spaces to understand our world and the rapid changes happening, to learn how to prepare and respond to these changes, and, and to enhance public engagement with science. And, and people are really tuned into science right now, and, and so there is opportunity for, for us. Uh, go to the, the next slide, please. And then here from an, an operations perspective at, at Skudik Institute, it's, it's definitely been a challenge. Uh, the campus has, has been quiet, uh, pretty quiet since, since March, since mid-March. And you know, convening of large groups such as this one can't happen in, in a pandemic. Um, but at the same time, our science and, and science in the park uh, continues. And the way I like to think about this is that environmental change hasn't stopped during the pandemic and, and neither has our science. And, and like nature, we've had to adapt. And so I'm sure these are true for many of you. Field crews perhaps have been smaller. Field seasons are shorter or maybe they got shifted in time. And, you know, in that 15 passenger van that used to carry 14 citizen scientists, well, this summer it only seated two a driver and one person sitting alone in that, that third row bench. Uh, and, and, and we know you all have had some challenges and, and opportunities too. And, and that's part of what we'll, we'll hear from today. We'll hear from, from Laura Cohen and Becky Cole Will from the park um, uh, about the ongoing work and even opportunities to work on things that perhaps they didn't get to in, in a typical year. And certainly so much research continues to happen in Acadia and Emma Albee will, will tell us about this. And, and I'll also hear from uh, Kate Ruskin, who's one of our, our second century stewardship fellows and a researcher at UMaine about actually weaving COVID-19 into her visitor study in, in Acadia and, and taking an, an opportunity there. And then finally, we'll, we're trying to make the science symposium as interactive as possible and make sure to give everyone a voice uh, and we'll hear from Catherine Schmidt on this survey that you all all participated in and we, we really wanted to hear from the science community um, here to see how everybody's doing and to to share that that information and we have people from far and wide today so some folks who couldn't have made it uh, uh, to an in-person gathering. So welcome to all. Thanks for continuing your critical work in Acadia and like nature for being adaptive. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Abe and, and I have to check the chat to see if anybody got the uh, plant right. Ooh, that was a tough one. That was a, that was a stumper. That, I wouldn't have known that, except uh, unless I'd taken the picture. That is the catberry or mountain holly, uh, which is the Ilex mucronata, and that was at Breaking Bud uh, in the spring. All right, back to you, Abe. <laughs> Start with the challenge, huh? Um, so now we're uh, so now we're about to get into the meat of the science symposium. Before we do that, though, I just have one last request. Um, just remember to ask questions in the chat and. And during the symposium, uh, please think about three questions that we'll come back to at the end. You're welcome to chat your thoughts on them during the symposium, um, but we'll, we'll come back to them at the, at the final discussion section. The three questions are, are, what do you think are the main take homes from what you're hearing from the speakers and the survey results? Essentially, 
where are we right now and, and where are we going? What are, what are your take homes about that? Uh, what are the points that really surprise you? Uh, was there something that was unexpected? And, and what are the key points that we are missing uh, from the presentations and discussion during the session? So please think about those questions and we'll come back to them at the end, um, but feel free to chat and, and answer um, in or chat your thoughts uh, as we go. Uh, with that, I'm gonna, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Rebecca Cole-Will, our Chief of Resource Management here at Acadia to talk about the state of science and resource management in the park. Take it away, Rebecca. Thank you. Welcome everyone. Welcome, and, and I, as Abe and everyone has said before, we appreciate you zooming in one more time. I know that we're all living in this world of pods and an abundance of caution and all of the, the tropes around this. But anyway, welcome and we're very pleased that you're here. Next, please. <clears throat> Next slide. Oh yeah, thanks. Okay. And you know, we're we're it's all about change, right? And we've been working and thinking around the idea of change for a really long time. Climate change, how we do change uh, management in a national park, but this brings a, a kind of a whole different light to it. But I, I guess what I would say is that we're still thinking that way. And uh, this is one more uh, um, unpredictable kind of change that has come our way. And what I'd like to do is kind of just run through kind of some of the ways we're thinking about how we do this to, for science and management in a national park you know, obviously using good science, engaging stakeholders, adaptive management, communication, we experiment, and then at the end of the day, we need to listen and learn and do it all over again. So I wanna just run through a few examples of what we've been kind of working on um, and kind of where I see us going in the next year or so in uh, the resource management division. So next, please. <clears throat> So this is our charismatic fauna at Acadia National Park. Um, as everybody knows, this is the uh, beaver and the beaver here is, is symbolic of a lot of things, and, but more about how we manage people than how we manage wildlife, uh, really. So uh, uh, we have a lot of, of, of conflicts between our infrastructure and what these animals want to do and, and as they live in, and are a native in our uh, wetlands and our waterways. They have a lot of conflicts with our neighbors who don't understand you know, what beaver are up to. And so we've spent a lot of time kind of really doubling down and I wanted to bring out our wildlife biologist, Vic Weaver, our environmental protection specialist, Jason Flynn, uh, Bill Golly in the water program, Brian Henkel in the Wild Acadia, we really have worked on trying to build a, a metric to be able to communicate why these animals are really good and how do we uh, manage conflicts between animals and our infrastructure and to with uh, our uh, folks as well. So next slide, please. So a case study, this is the, uh, the bridge at Hodgton Pond. Okay, that's great, that's fine too. Um, how do we do stakeholder engagement in the time of COVID? Well, this is how we do it. You get the 15 or 20 so neighbors. So we have neighbors in a national park and they have opinions and they have a lot of interests and they don't always necessarily you know, align with ours. But in this case, we, the national park control the outlet to the pond on which they spend their summers and have a lot of value to this place. Our beaver uh, cause problems for their property, right? And so we spent a lot of time talking with folks around competing values uh, for uh, infrastructure, for a native species who's actually uh, prom promotes uh, incredibly good uh, health of wetlands and is really in critical to the, the success of some of these places. We spent a lot of time in the last year working with these folks to kind of work through some of these questions around um, 
are, are we going to just trap beaver every time someone has their dock flooded or are we going to uh, try to work with folks and so what we, we spent time on that this year in the stakeholder engagement and we kind of got to a successful result in, in this project which i'm pleased about so next slide So this is called a beaver deceiver. And this is a device that will allow the beaver to continue to do their, their thing in the pond, but not be able to block up the culvert, raise water levels or control water levels um, in a way that's not quote unquote natural. And so uh, we have about 15 out of the 16 landowners who surround us happy with this result. Um, you know, we can't please everyone, but but the end, as I said, at the end of the day, we really deeply engaged with, the, with stakeholders, we communicated, and we came to a consensus where we could find a, a solution that um, is, is good for, for the park, good for the animals, good for our, our road and bridge, and hopefully good for our neighbors as well. Uh, next, please. So uh, adaptive management, which is a, a something we're really thinking about a lot here at Acadia. No, this is not the IPCC high emission scenario at all. This is Acadia's high emission scenario. As you can see, tracking the numbers over our visitation over the last 10 years, and now we've got two more years of data beyond this, um, we are uh, a very, very popular place in the world, right? Uh, the seventh most visited park, and part of our the issue here is next. <laughs> next slide, please. We love our we love our visitors, uh, every every one of them. But the problems with the congestion of of, of vehicles and parking, and uh, this park just wasn't meant to 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 hold as many cars as we're seeing, and so. Uh, well, one of the, the long-term projects about a, adaptive management is to try to figure out how can we build a system that will allow people to come, have some assurance that they're going to be able to find a place to park at Cadillac for sunrise or not, or um, be able to plan a, their visit so they have that, a really good experience. And so next slide. So working on this reservation system that I'm sure you've all heard about, which happened over the last uh, couple of weeks here. And we're just starting now to kind of look at the end result of that. Uh, Adam Gibson, our social scientist, spent uh, many, many hours and with his team out doing monitoring and uh, we're, we're to understand, crunch the data around where visitors are going, their behavior, to be able to help us build a system where we can address and and help visitors and protect park resources at the end of the day uh, around congestion. So this is again, social science and people. Uh, the, we, uh, as many of you know, and, and we'll hear a lot more about this is our vegetation management program over the, the, the next few uh, science symposiums. This is our, uh, uh, SCC's uh, intern, Sophie, standing on the side of Cadillac Mountain. And does anybody know what that plant is? And I'm sure many, many, many of you know what this is. Um, it's of course, glossy black buckthorn. It's a, it's a noxious, I don't know if it's noxious, Jesse, but it's an invasive species. It, we have a lot of it in Acadia and uh, Jesse Wheeler and his team are working on addressing invasive plants and their impact to the park. Uh, and have been doing so. And Jesse's saying in his comments, just noxious to me. So it's an invasive species. And next slide. <clears throat> so how do we clean up the messes we create? Well, one of the ways we do that is to think about adaptive management, right? And using really good science to understand what, what, what is the, what is the, what are the, insults to our places and what can we do about that using the best available science and engage stakeholders and communicate the science. So this is Brian Henkel, who's the uh, project manager for the Wild Acadia project, uh, doing a public pro uh, a program down in Tremont to say, 
to, to communicate with the landowners there and, and our and neighbors around, what do you know about the uh, history and the condition of the Marshall Brook watershed? And how could you help us to understand as we move ahead with some major restoration work on invasive plants in, in that watershed? Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, and you saw in, in Nick's uh, presentation, I think he showed you one of the, the plots at the top of Cadillac Mountain that his interns and his program is involved in helping us figure out, a, 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 we had another problem on the, our subalpine summits, right? Our visitors love going to our mountains and we want them to go there, but part of the, the impact has been the degradation of the, the plant communities on, on the summits. and. So what some of the work around experimenting, next slide please, to figure out what's gonna work up there. And, and I know Jill Weber has been chatting up and she's one of the scientists that is involved with this project To And then next slide, this is the top of Cadillac Mountain. This has been the, the site of an ongoing research to figure out what can we do to restore plant communities on these, these uh, summits. Next slide, please. So, adaptive management, uh, experiment, and then communicate the results. So this was two or three years ago with the first plantings of the, on, the, on Cadillac. Next slide, please. And this is an example of the success that we're seeing with how to restore uh, you know, native vegetation on these, on these summits. Next slide, slide please. And this is the result that we're looking for. And what's this plant for all of the, you who are, are native plant specialists? Uh, this is the next, next project. Um, so this is really an interesting one. What do you do when you have a nationally significant national register property? This is the gate lodge at Brown Mountain. That, yes, it is a wood lily, yes. Um, and it also happens to be a bat habitat and you have your historic preservation architects who wanna come in and uh, do, do uh, historic preservation work on our bat habitats. How are we going to balance those two kinds of competing values necessarily? And well, the way we're doing it is by doing really integrated interdisciplinary work together. So on the left is uh, Morgan Ingalls, who is one of our lead biotechs in the, in the BAT program. And on the right is Molly Donlan. And this was taken last year when Molly was a, uh, a, a, an Acadia fellow through College of the Atlantic in the, uh, the program that Ken Klein has been doing to bring interns into the park to work on projects. And this last summer, and right now, Molly is actually a, a wildlife biologist in the green and gray. So we're growing up this uh, cadre of young scientists that are working in the park in this great partnership with, with, with COA. Next slide. Hmm. So this is the critter uh, the, under consideration. This is one of the, uh, the, the bat species that uh, are, are in decline in, in Acadia and the team has been working to and put uh, telemetry on them. Next slide. And over the course of the last couple of years, what we've learned, <laughs> next slide, <laughs> is that, as I said, that the bats love to live in the gate lodges. And so part of the, the, the compliance <laughs> around uh, the work there is to do, to do the uh, rehabilitation work on the structures when the bats aren't there figuring out that, you know, it's just that simple, but it's, it's a, the, the complexity of integrating our uh, historic preservation program with our bat biology program. Who knew, right? This is uh, a, a project, this is the, uh, uh, this is my first experience as an archeologist. I, I here at uh, Acadia National Park back in 1978. We did a lot of uh, research here, uh, collected uh, a lot of uh, data and, We've got artifacts that have been sitting in our collection storage facility since about 1980 with very little information or availability of those. that. Next slide. So 
Uh, we've got an incredible project going on with Dr. Bonnie Newsom, who is a second century stewardship fellow with the Skudik Institute and her interns who are Wabanaki, Wabanaki students in the back is Natalie. And I don't know if Natalie and Isaac, hello, if you're on, uh, out there in uh, Zoom land, uh, Natalie is Passamaquoddy and Isaac is uh, uh, Malisey. And they're working with Dr. Bonnie Newsom to uh, use these collections and to translate the knowledge and apply it back to the Wabanaki communities. So what do Wabanaki people know about the uh, 13,000 years of living on this land? Well, a lot. But what do they know about the archeological collections from Acadia National Park or many other national parks? Probably not a lot because we've never been shared that out. And so Bonnie is working on a project to figure out how do we do that? How do we, as archeologists, how do they take indigenous knowledge and translate it and give it back to the Wabanaki community so it's available to them. Uh, next slide. And so this is a really exciting project because it's sharing out this critical information of, about heritage resources that are that, that really belong in the communities. And so some of the exciting things they're doing is building a vocabulary of Wabanaki words to describe something like a biface um, and to do some other work around uh, making, making this, this project available. Uh, next. On a similar vein, and quickly to finish up, this is another project that we're working with with the uh, Wabanaki communities, Suzanne Greenlaw at the University of Maine, who's Malisey and Michelle Baumfleck, who is uh, uh, with the for uh, Forest Service, working on understanding the relationship of Wab contemporary Wabanaki basket weavers to a critical resource, which is sweetgrass, which we happen to have a, 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 a resource here in the park that's accessible and available to community gatherers to harvest. Next. And the, the, as I, the, this speaks for itself, this is around communication and listening and learning and, and uh, involving people who have a direct connection to the park back to resources that are important to them. And these are some of the, the, the important things that, that they are telling us about projects like this one. Next. And I lost my words, but the lessons here were, um, this is uh, Gal Frey telling me what she knows about this place, which is a whole lot more than what I know about it. She had to show me what sweet grass was, because how would I know? Um, and to you know, pr provide that connection to the places that, are, uh, that, are, that other people have a, in, as much of an interest in as we do. So um, next. Ah, there we go. So who are the experts? Like I said, it's not me, consultation and, uh, and then being a building methodologies to support indigenous knowledge. Next. So just where we're going from here, um, some of you have been involved with some of our ongoing like planning process or scenario planning or, or hot prioritization work. And you're gonna say, oh gosh, not again. You're not gonna do that again, but yeah, we are. We're gonna start another kind of planning process. This is a, uh, something that's kind of standardized in the Park Service called a resource stewardship strategy. Part of the reasons to do this, you know, it's been five years or more since we've checked in on, our, on what our priorities are. And also as I, we have uh, new staff, Adam uh, Gibson's a new social scientist, Vic Weaver's our new wildlife biologist, and Jesse Wheeler is our new plant biologist. And so it's time to check in, identify priorities, evaluate what we know about our resources and where we should be going uh, in the future in terms of thinking about adaptive, really about adaptive management as, as, as we move ahead. So some of you or all of you are gonna be welcome to come along with us on that kind of process if you're, if you're interested in terms of you know, helping us identify what our, we know what our resources are, right? But we're, what are, what are some of the priority kinds of uh, uh, 
work that we should be doing here to, to really be able to help us understand all this change uh, and, and where we ought to be, be going with that and to engage and communicate, which is where we're going next with my dear friend, Laura Cohen, who's going to be speaking next for us, I believe. So next slide, which I think is my last one. Nope. Uh, so at, at the end of the day, this is where we wanna be, right? And, uh, and my last slide simply says, thank you, but I'll be around and I welcome any questions or thoughts. I know we're running a little bit late, so maybe Abe, we want to just uh, move on. But yeah, I'm around. Yeah. What I'll, thank you very much, Rebecca. That was great. And um, what I'll do is I'll encourage anybody that has questions to go ahead and ask them in the chat and we'll come back. Uh, uh, Rebecca can answer the questions during uh, while the other talks are going on in the chat, or we can come back to them at the end of the, at the, end of the session. Um, but that was great. There was a lot, a lot there for sure. And um, and it's really impressive how much is going on even with the disruptions by COVID-19. Um, so next I'll introduce Laura Cohen, our Chief of Visitor Experience and Education for Acadia uh, to talk about uh, the state of visitor engagement and education in the park. Thank you so much, Abe, and thanks, Becky. Uh, it's so excited to hear uh, all that's happened and all that's uh, going to continue to happen in the future. Um, as uh, Abe shared, I'm Laura Cohen. I'm the Chief of Visitor Experience and Education. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, so what do we do for in visitor experience and education? Uh, we work collaboratively. We work with others internally and externally to create a transformative visitor experience rooted in the power of this place and its people, driven by management objectives and shared via powerful stories. And that happens across a life cycle for the visitor. Uh, it's really not a single touch point in which we interact with a visitor, but a spectrum. And that spectrum includes touch points that are both in-person, in-park touch points, and also, particularly this year, virtual ones. So uh, that can start with an idea or an awareness that Acadia National Park or a certain aspect of the park exists, some sort of process by which the visitor goes through either planning a physical visit or deciding to visit us virtually, uh, the visit itself, and then what happens after that visit. So in visitor experience and education, uh, we look towards this full spectrum of the visitor experience and how we can uh, create an experience with our visitor that helps uh, achieve our goals and be the best visitor experience that a visitor can have. Next slide, please. So how do we do that? What, what is it that we actually do? So uh, there's a lot of different comp components to the visitor experience, but some core ones are visitor services. So this is providing information, orientation, and wayfinding to our visitors. For a lot of um, people that are coming to Acadia for the first, second, or even third time, it can be a really challenging place just to understand physically what is where and how to get to A to B. So we spend, um, uh, a lot of our energy really thinking about the, the most efficient uh, and easy way that we can do that for our visitors and how, how we can provide them great customer service. Uh, also contained uh, in, our, in our work is programming. So these are formal and informal experiences that uh, allow the visitor to create a deep and lifelong connection to this place. We do public programming. So for formal programs, that's going to be your walks and talks and hikes. Um, informal programming, this might be where you come across us on a trail and we decide to create poetry with you or to have you observe Peregrine Fountain or uh, ways that we can uh, informally create an, an experience uh, with you on the fly. Uh, we also do curriculum-based programs. So this is going to be reaching out to students and lifelong learners. So we have a wide variety of day programs or field trips, and then also um, our uh, 
partnership run Scudic Education Adventure Residential Program, where we invite middle school students in for um, multiple days of in-depth uh, science and education. Uh, and our goal, as I said before, is to seamlessly blend the virtual and the in-person experience throughout all of these touch points. Uh, I think as most of us move through the world, we're, we're uh, reaching for our phones when we're trying to identify a plant or find out what a building is or figure out how to get from A to B. And so we have to think about not only what does something look like on the ground, but how does that, how does that actually mirror what they're finding online or in a virtual environment. Next slide, please. So why do we do it? Um, you know, the short answer is to protect this place, to protect park resources, uh, a better, uh, more connected and informed visitor helps us both in the short run and throughout future generations to protect this park. We also do it to protect park visitors. So we want visitors to have an enjoyable visit here, uh, a visit that that um, allows them to make uh, an incredible connection or life transformative change in their life, um, but also just, just keeps them safe while they're here. Um, and uh, finally, to that point of creating lifelong connections, you know, we hope that through whether it's a virtual or an in-person visit to Acadia National Park, that they form that connection that transforms uh, how they think about the world and how they think about the park and maybe whether they will come back and visit again. Um, and we do this through experiences and storytelling because the science tells us that it is the best way to get people to transform, to, uh, to communicate to them, not through lectures all the time or facts, but through experiences and stories. And so we, create, we craft our visitor, visitor experience um, around the idea of storytelling. Next slide, please. So this year uh, was, uh, as for all of us, like no other. Uh, and with COVID, we had to, our wonderful staff had to make a lot of adaptations to the visitor experience and also their lives here at work to keep themselves safe and the visitors safe. So we adapted our visitor services operations to run full-time outdoors and use, as you can see in this picture, um, six feet of tables and pointers and plastic dividers uh, along with personal protective equipment to uh, still meet the visitor's needs but to do it in a different way. This also um, led to a lot of uh, change in signage across the park. So a lot of communication around uh, mask wearing and, and social distancing across the park. And then changing really the way that when we go out into the park and walk in and around people, the way that our staff go about that process and how we work with the visitor. Next slide, please. hand in hand with that, not only to the public, but behind the scenes, COVID changed our world on a day-to-day -day basis. So challenges, of course, of bringing on a large seasonal staff and housing, what that meant for how we can keep people working alongside each other, even driving vehicles to and from different places, technology, having enough computers to to give to people and have them not be sharing surfaces that they're talking with each other. And then uh, how we train up our seasonal staff, how many people are actually in the building. We changed their work schedules so that we had as few people in the, in the building as we possibly could. Next slide, please. So all of these things um, you know, could be looked at at challenges. They also led to, uh, as challenges, but they also led to a lot of opportunities, which we'll talk about next. Um, in terms of the visitor experience, the COVID challenge, I think, um, was layered for me. It was something that there were parts of it that I didn't really expect. And one of them, I think, was wondering whether visitors were gonna be even receptive to interacting with us. So uh, on the slide here, you can see our Junior Ranger program where we're swearing in uh, kids who have completed our Junior Ranger book. Uh, we had to think about how to change that in a way that parents would still want their 
their children to interact with us um, and to do that in a different way. And so as we you know, think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's really hard to have a transformative place-based experience when someone's worried about their physical safety. So we thought long and hard as a team um, and really came together with a lot of, of adaptations um, to hopefully allow visitors to have a little bit of, of a deeper connection despite the current environment. Next slide, please. And last but not least, the um, uh, a couple of the, the differences around and challenges around 2020, uh, you could see here where we were doing um, walks and talks. We were able to do a couple of different walks. We did our Stars Over Sand Beach program, which looks at the night sky. We did a carriage road uh, hike, which allowed us to socially distance on the carriage road. Uh, and so we were able to create uh, some of those experiences that we like to have created in other years, but in different ways. Um, and other than COVID, as you know, and Kevin, you kind of touched touched on this a little bit. Um, this was a year really where we we learned a lot about science literacy within the public and the public trust. And I think this is something that we're going to be reflecting on for years to come. We already sort of knew that this was was coming, but as we look towards Acadia as a place where people can learn about science, learn about scientific concepts, uh, and interact with practical on the ground science and scientists, in a way, we have the opportunity to build that public trust in science. Uh, we'll do that through communication, we'll do that through programming, uh, but we know that um, this is an uphill climb for us today. And as you said, we can all mirror, mirror Dr. Shaw as we work uh, in that direction. Next slide, please. So some of the opportunities uh, that we had uh, or turned, you know, turned things into opportunities here uh, at Acadia was virtual programming. So uh, for education, our wonderful rangers were able to transform within a few weeks in the spring uh, are what would have been field trips or in-classroom programs to virtual programs provided to students and teachers via Zoom and, and a lot of other platforms. Uh, if any of you work with kids, you know that, or work with schools, you know that schools often have different platforms, use different, you know, one school will use Zoom, another will use Google Meet. Uh, and so there's a lot of sort of logistical changes around this, um, but our staff really rose to the challenge to continue to provide information on animal adaptations and um, all of the wonderful science concepts to kids, not only in, a, uh, in Maine, but around the country uh, virtually. We also uh, served thousands of children in and around Acadia National Park with our partners and friends of Acadia with providing at-home science kits to schools, knowing that as is happening right now, our fall programming was going to be pretty heavily virtual again with kids. And kids do not always have not only access to technology and internet service, let alone rulers and pipettes and construction paper and all those things that we take for granted in terms of tools of the trade with actually doing science. So we were able to put together uh, kits to take to school so that kids would have some tools at home to do virtual programming with us. Next slide, please. We also did some virtual programming as well with the public. So this is our Ion Acadia webcam, uh, which will be we piloted this year and we'll be working on uh, again next year uh, to be able to provide some live streaming experience of various aspects of Acadia National Park to the public. Um, also down below are some uh, video, um, which we had multiple videos this year that we worked on putting together. And we'll continue in the future looking towards how do we take the science that's happening in Acadia National Park and tie it together in a nice story uh, to be able to send to people virtually. Next slide, please. One opportunity uh, that we, we took was with the reduction in in-person programming, we were still able to bring on a large number of staff. So we really focused heavily this year on training 
so many of our seasonal staff members in how to update our website and create content. We created over 100 individual pieces of content to add to the website, many of them uh, highlighting, as you can see here, um, science-based uh, issues and stories, uh, not only activities like the virtual light activity you see there at the top. So this person doesn't need to be in Acadia to conduct this activity, but how great for them to come to Acadia and virtually to understand how, how they can relate to their night sky at home. So this is something that we will uh, continue to do and continuing to work with our coworkers in, in our resources management, resources stewardship department to, um, expand our offerings on our website. Next slide, please. Uh, and so we are going to be continuing to look at virtual programming, both for curriculum uh, based programming and for the public in 2021. We are really excited that our partners, the Friends of Acadia um, focused for their uh, annual meeting and their fundraising opportunities on how to best support us in providing virtual programming. So we're going to be setting up studios and have uh, Ranger, uh, mobile Ranger studio kits to really take our programming, our virtual programming to the next level in 2020. So lots of great science topics to come. A little pitch, if you don't follow us yet on Facebook, uh, it's a great opportunity uh, to find out about some of those programmings. Next, please. Uh, we'll continue in 2021 uh, to keep citizen science as one of our uh, primary goals, not only conducting it in the park, uh, but also sharing uh, all the great citizen science that is happening via the web and social media. This is a great story from uh, last year where one of our students uh, discovered an invasive crab, uh, and we expect a lot, a lot more of these opportunities to come. Uh, next slide, please. Well, uh, in addition to citizen science, one of our primary goals uh, for the coming future is going to continue to be to reaching new to reach new audiences. Uh, we know that uh, a certain type of people tend to like the outdoors and come to Acadia repeatedly. But one of the opportunities that virtual gives us is the ability to purposely and intentionally go out there and reach people that aren't coming or maybe would not, um, you know, think of coming. That's where we can really raise awareness uh, about how we can reach uh, a wide, wider variety and that's going to come not only the opportunities there are going to come not only with the stories that we tell, but also the types of programs that we offer and, and what types of in person and, and virtual experiences do we offer. Next slide please. Uh, and last uh, but not least, we will continue uh, to work with our science team to develop uh, this part of our website. So really focusing on current research that's going on in the park. There's a lot of uh, great things. Becky just shared a small snippet of them. And so we have some great stories to tell. So we'll be looking at working on not only celebrating current research, but past research on the website. And then also looking at Acadia's place in science history. Um, we want to make sure that science um, is relevant to people in the 21st century. So we can not only reflect on where science has, has come from and Acadia's role contributing to science, but also as these pictures show where science is headed um, and, and all of the great uh, people and science that's happening here. Next slide, please. couple of little uh, highlights that are coming up in our future. So uh, we're going to be working uh, PB with PBS, who has a Sci uh, Girls programming. So we'll be pairing up uh, female scientists in Acadia National Park with uh, young girls that are interested in science. Uh, we're continuing to work with our um, friends uh, at the Skudik Institute on a project that is modeling uh, nor the impact of nor'easters on nor'easters on coastal environment and working on integrating that into our education and public programming. Next slide, please. Uh, looking at our Scudic Education Adventure Program, Nick uh, did touch on it, but we were not able to bring 
uh, students overnight, of course, uh, during COVID to uh, this wonderful program, uh, but we're all keeping our fingers crossed for 2021 and hoping to, to bring that program online. And last but not least, our front, Frontiers of the Young Mind, which is a um, online uh, science newsletter for, for a better word or journal um, that uh, pairs um, scientists with um, young science writers uh, to create the scientific article for youth. And so uh, we will be working um, with a park researcher to uh, develop an article about park puddles and looking at our um, um, rock pools in Acadia National Park and what does that tell us about habitat response to climate change in the future. So great example of how we can reach a new audience with science storytelling here at Acadia. So uh, I think that's all I have. Thank you all again so much for joining us. I'm looking forward to, to hearing rest of the presentations. Thanks a bunch, Laura, really appreciate it. And again, if anybody has any questions, feel free to pose them for Laura in the chat and, uh, and she can respond to them there. But otherwise we'll move right along. Um, over to uh, Emma Alvey, um, who's the science information specialist with the Scudic Institute. Most, most of you, probably all of you, uh, because I think the registration actually managed, Emma managed that, but most of you interacted with Emma in lots of ways. Um, she's the one that keeps really our science information here at Acadia flowing um, from helping with the permits to archiving and making our vast uh, historical records accessible. Um, and here uh, in this talk, she's gonna be giving a summary of the research that took place um, here in the park in 2020, including a peek at some of the impacts uh, that COVID-19 had on our, uh, on our park research. And over to you, Emma. Okay, thank you, Abe. So as Abe said, I'm gonna talk about the research permits and some numbers, and so for those of you less familiar with research in Acadia. If people want to come and do research in Acadia, they need to apply for a research permit. And so many people get those, we give them to park staff and then many other people from other institutions, universities, um, other places get them. So next slide. And so the number of research permits has been increasing over the past two decades. This year, the number was down a little bit, most likely due to the pandemic. However, we have still had more research permits this year than we did in 2012. And the numbers for this graph were updated through October 15th. And we'll likely have several more permits before the end of the year. So it will actually be even higher than that number. And just some um, dates of interest. So Scudic Institute was created in 2004. The L.L. Bean and Scudic Fellowships was started in 2007. The first Acadia National Park Science Symposium and the grand reopening of the Scudic Institute campus were in 2011. And then the Second Century Stewardship Initiative was started in 2016. So you can see as all of those events have happened, research has continued to increase. Next slide. So this shows the topics of research permits, which vary year to year. Each chunk of bars is one topic, and then each bar is for a specific year. So the topics are birds and other animals, forests and freshwater, marine health, and then other, which includes air quality, geology, and social science. And you can see how those have varied every year. Next slide. This shows the general locations of research this year. So you can see that um, most research takes place on Mount Desert Island, which is closely followed by MDI and Scudic, and then only Scudic. And so there are also a few projects that have field work locations on outer islands, including Isla Ho. You can go to my next slide, which has maps of research locations in the park. So these maps show the specific locations for research, which many research projects have anywhere from several to 
100 or 200 sites per project. And so these have the dots for 2020, 2019, and 2018, just for comparison. And the light green on the map is park fee lands. So most of the research that we track is inside of park fee lands. And so you can see that there are a few locations on Isla Ho. Um, and so Isla Ho is a small island five miles off the coast of Maine and about 15 miles southwest of MDI. And it's accessible only by ferry. And then there are many locations on Mount Desert Island spread all across the island. Um, and so for those of you less familiar, Mount Desert Island is a, the large island just off the coast of Maine, accessible by a bridge. And then there are many locations on Skudik Peninsula with a focus on Skudik Point. You can see the all the dots at the bottom at the tip of Skudik Point. And so Skudik Peninsula is four miles east of Mount Desert Island as the crow flies. To drive there, it's a lot longer, but it's actually not that far away. And next slide. So now I'm going to talk about some numbers from 2020. So 30% of research permits were new projects, which was slightly down from last year, which is probably due to the pandemic. 20% of research permits included research in the intertidal zone, which is pretty much the same as last year. And when you think of it, research in the intertidal zone is relatively easy to do following the COVID-19 safety protocols. You can physically distance, you can wear your mask all while doing research in the intertidal zone. Then 11% of research permits included citizen science, which is slightly down from last year, which kind of makes sense because it's more difficult to do citizen science and follow the COVID-19 safety protocols. It's harder to have groups of people and to be able to work with them. And then there were 39 principal investigators. So there are some principal investigators that have multiple permits. Some have four or five or six, and some just have a couple. And then there were 319 research perm research sites, which I showed you on that map, um, not including the long-term inventory monitoring sites. And that was down from last year because we had fewer projects. Next slide. And so now I'm going to focus on some of the impacts of COVID-19 on research in Acadia. So as I showed you on my first slide, there are 54 research field projects this year in 2020, which was down from 80 projects last year. Um, five of those studies were canceled because of COVID-19, likely because researchers either could not do the work safely while physically distancing, they could not travel to the park or had other complications. And some of those include the Scudic Education Adventure or the C program that Laura talked about previously. And then studies to monitor conditions in the forests, rocky intertidal, and salt marshes in Acadia. And then many other researchers did not apply for research permits because of COVID, but we don't really know what that number is. Next slide. So this shows a timeline of research and COVID-19. So on March 26, Akita National Park suspended visitor services and closed facilities, including the park loop road, campgrounds, and carriage roads. One study had actually been completed before March 31st when um, the Maine issued a stay at home, stay healthy at home directive. And that study surveyed winter behaviors of river otters in Mitchell Pond. And so because that was a winter study that had already been done. And so then all studies were suspended on April 3rd because of the state safety guidelines, the stay safer at home order. And then on May 5th, we started approving research permits with revised safety plans following the COVID-19 safety guidelines. So some studies continued as planned. Um, if they had small groups of researchers who could physically distance or work remotely, and some researchers had to substantially change the scope of their studies, but still did some field work. And my last slide. And so this shows some examples of research in Acadia. So in the uh, using citizen science to investigate changes in timing of peak fall foliage, which is in the upper left. Restoration of vegetation on Cadillac Mountain, which is in the lower left that Becky and Nick both talked about. Investigating the impact of COVID on visitor behavior experiences, 
the upper right. So we actually had a research project looking at COVID and visitors. And this study is also taking place in Grand Teton, Shenandoah, Glacier, and Yellowstone National Park. Um, one on the value of Acadia's freshwater resources in the lower right, which you'll hear about in a few minutes. And then we had projects on water quality in lakes and monitoring for potential harmful algal blooms, surveys of bird breeding and migrations and development of a bird vocalization library, southern pine beetle survey, which this beetle is an invasive insect pest, but it's not yet found in Acadia, survey of red pine populations, which as many of you know, they have been declining recently because of invasive red pine scale, surveys on bat ecology like Becky was talking about, surveys of intertidal seaweeds and long-term changes in tidal flora, changes in clam ecology and health in intertidal mudflats, um, economic impacts of park tourism, monitoring peregrine falcons and freshwater wetland hydrology, air quality monitoring, studying red maples, studying biodiversity and hydrology in Great Meadow and Bass Harbor Marsh. So you can see we have a very wide variety of research happening in Acadia. And back to you, Abe. Thank you, Emma. Really appreciate it. That was great. Um, good high level summary. If anybody has any questions uh, for Emma, feel free to ask those in the chat too. And this last slide is a great transition because uh, one of those signs uh, on Emma's last slide was actually from the research project for our next speaker, um, who's Kate Ruskin, um, who is uh, from the University of Maine, and she and and also one of our second century stewardship fellows, and she's going to be talking a little bit about her work to kind of give an example of the research that's going on here, how she adjusted it to COVID nineteen to actually incorporate it into a research project. Um, and, and how it affected her work. But yeah, so over to you, Kate. Thanks, Abe. Next slide, please. So one thing I always love about the Acadia Science Symposium is that I'm talking to a bunch of people who already love Acadia. And um, I think uh, you probably, when you think of Acadia and what you like to do there, are probably thinking of Acadia's water resources, at least to some extent. Maybe you've gone paddling um, on one of the ponds or gone swimming. Next slide, please. Um, many people in Acadia also enjoy um, outdoor recreation activities that are consumptive, um, like fishing um, in the waters in and around Acadia National Park. Next slide, please. Maybe you, like many visitors, just like taking in the views of Acadia's uh, beautiful waters. Um, maybe you just like knowing that they're there and serving as habitat uh, where wildlife are protected. Next slide, please. And another great thing about the Acadia Science Symposium is that it gathers together researchers and educators who know the value of using national parks like Acadia as a living lab and a classroom. Next slide, please. Um, so basically, there are a lot of people who engage in activities, recreational, educational, um, in Acadia National Park. And so the project I set out to do this season was to characterize um, the values of Acadia's stakeholders for their water resources. So things like what kind of activities do people think should be allowed in Acadia's waters? Um, are there restrictions on those activities? Um, what do they characterize as high quality water resources or water? Um, and next slide, please. The way I had planned to do this was your sort of standard visitor intercept surveys. Um, so you main students walking around with a clipboard asking visitors and other stakeholders like local residents, uh, natural resource managers, what their opinions are. Uh, next slide, please. And one of those undergraduates, Dominique Despirito, who also helped me put together this uh, presentation, we did manage to get in one day of surveying last fall where Dominique actually went to the park and encountered visitors. Um, but then we were planning our main sort of survey effort to be this summer. And so we had to shift our, um, our strategy a fair bit to adapt to COVID safety protocols. Next slide, please. And so what we wound up with was remote visitor surveying done primarily through putting signs out in the park and uh, with QR codes that if somebody holds their phone up to it uh, with a camera app on, it would bring them to a web page where they could take our, our survey virtually. We also emphasized uh, remote reach outs 
through email listservs and social media posts. Next slide, please. And this is the spot where I'd like to thank Andrea Knapp, who is one of our, the other undergraduate at UMaine who worked on this project over the summer um, because she was already a summit steward in Acadia. And so that was another thing we did was trying to minimize the personnel who were uh, entering the MDI community. Um, and she's also local um, to the Midcoast region. Um, so anyway, we did pretty well with this remote surveying. We have over 300 survey responses. Um, 22 local residents, 10 managers, 11 academics, including researchers, students, and educators. Um, and then the rest are visitors um, as of a few weeks ago. Next slide, please. And I also think that, um, you know, as I was thinking about how to adapt uh, this project, which hinged on encountering people and interacting people, which is exactly what we didn't want um, due to COVID, uh, it got me thinking about new opportunities as well. I think we've all probably seen among our friends and family uh, that people are, are changing how they think about recreating outside. I think we as a human species are kind of renegotiating our relationship with nature, whether that takes the form of people taking up running who've never done it before in their lives or uh, the fantastic record sales that the RV industry has seen. We've got evidence all around us that people are, are changing how they spend time outdoors. Next slide, please. Um, I just got this, looked this up on Google Scholar uh, the other day to see how many studies have already been published relating COVID to outdoor recreation. And it it gave me 1800 results. I didn't go through all of them, but it was, I got to about page 13 before it switched to medical uh, research. And so everything before that was related to outdoor recreation. Um, and so I'm really impressed with how much science about COVID and outdoor recreation has already come out. And that says nothing of the studies that are currently in the works. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of how that affected um, our project, um, oh, here's an example of a public, uh, a, uh, a published article that's already come out. Oh, and I also wanted to say um, critical people here in the Acadia Science community for helping us adapt and pivot for our study were Abe and Emma for quick turnarounds with our permits. Thank you very much uh, with those amendments. And then brainstorming with Adam Gibson uh, also really was critical. Next slide, please. For us to incorporate some of these uh, questions related to COVID and take advantage of new opportunities for understanding how humans recreate outdoors in light of the pandemic. So we, while we were modifying our permits to uh, enact COVID safety protocols, added some questions to our survey about COVID. And uh, these include asking visitors, how, uh, how has COVID affected your trip to Acadia National Park? Generally, are you doing more or less outdoor recreation due to COVID? Um, and, and getting at people's perceptions of risks related to outdoor recreation. So we asked some questions like, do you think, are you doing more outdoor recreation because you uh, think it's safer because of COVID? Are you coming to Maine because Maine has lower caseloads than uh, other states in the Northeast? Next slide, please. Uh, and uh, I'm excited to dig into this data. We haven't started yet, um, but it gave us an opportunity to kind of branch out and look into an additional research question. And so you should, with your screen, be able to hold your phone up if you open your camera app right now and kind of hold it up to the screen so that it sees that QR code, it will bring you to our virtual survey. Um, and I would, I invite you to take it, please. Again, researchers, educators, and students are an important stakeholder group that we want to hit uh, and characterize how you feel about Acadia's water resources. And one of the things we did to adapt to uh, remote surveying was create a free postcard that we're gonna send to people to incentivize um, surveys. It's beautiful. Uh, next slide, please. So I encourage you to take that survey. I encourage you to contact me or Dominique if you have any questions, our contact information is there. And lastly, I would just like to thank um, the organizations who have helped put together this survey and helped us to adapt to these challenging, unexpected times for doing research, especially the second century stewardship and the folks at the Skudik Institute and Acadia National Park for their support. Thank you. Great, thank you, uh, Kate, really appreciate it. And we can send also the link to the survey in the follow-up email after the symposium. Great, thank you.
Um, and again, feel free to ask any questions of Kate in the chat. But um, in the interest of time, I will pass it right on over to um, to Catherine. To, so to close out um, the symposium, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Catherine Schmidt, who's the science communication specialist with the Skudik Institute. And she's going to be talking about the results of the survey, kind of how you are all doing or what how you told us you are doing um, to give a, a really a sense of, of how the our science community is, is feeling right now. Over to you, Catherine. You, might, um, there you, go. you should have received with the agenda and the link to the Zoom uh, uh, handout. Um, PDF of my slides with also some of the answers to the open-ended questions. Um, so please look at that and refer to it. And because of time, I encourage you to start the discussion in the chat while I'm sharing the data. And I'm sharing the data for those of you who have not had a chance to look at the handout or who may be um, just listening to the audio. So the first question we asked in the survey was, how are we feeling right now? Um, and this is how um, most of you answered. Um, most of you are doing okay. Um, you selected the smiley face. Um, a lot of you are just feeling kind of neutral or in fact bruising. Um, fewer of you just feel upside down or feeling sick or just a little bit or big and just, it'll, just try to pick out themes. And some of you um, may, in looking at the answers may have different themes. So that's something that we can talk about. But um, from my interpretation, time was certainly the biggest challenge. And I put time in quotation marks here because time isn't really the challenge, right? Um, the challenge is all the things you have to do in a limited amount of time. Um, but people's answers use the language of time to just discuss the workload, um, figuring out which balls to keep juggling and which to drop. Feels like I work all the time. Everything that was delayed is now happening all at once. Just staying afloat is a challenge. And there's just way too much work and way too little time. The second thing was isolation, which um, some of you mentioned specifically using that word. Some of you are struggling with the lack of face-to-face -face contact not being able to see family and friends, just missing people, um, being stuck um, in your tiny home office, sitting on Zoom or on the computer for significant parts of the day. Um, uncertainty is a challenge. Um, planning for the future with so much uncertainty. Trying to figure out ne your next steps in life during a pandemic election year. The impending winter with COVID and what is that going to look like? I think we all start. We all thought um, maybe it would be over or ending by now, and time has welcome. At the beginning, we welcomed the spring and everything coming to life was very um, was very encouraging. And I know for myself, it really helped me get by because people just wanted to go out and photograph flowers. And now all of a sudden, you know, and, and photograph birds, and now we're watching them leave again. And so that that has a feeling of sort of impending doom. Um, being motivated is a struggle, um, so staying motivated while working from home, the world seems very unstable, which is a huge distraction, has made self-motivation difficult, getting up the motivation to keep active and get out of the house, and, and be, ha being able to focus is a challenge. And then just staying healthy, staying COVID-free, managing stress, maintaining mental health, um, and feeling like everyone around you maybe isn't, isn't taking health as seriously as you are. We also did see a lot of opportunities, um, and this was very encouraging. Um, even though Zoom and technologies like this are a challenge, people saw a lot of opportunity in terms of things being more accessible both have it be having the ability to connect with more audiences who don't have access to some place like Acadia National Park, just reaching more people generally, um, connecting with more ideas. Um, and a few of you specifically cited 
networking and opportunities and collaboration that's actively happening right now. There's opportunity for public engagement. We've heard from several speakers this afternoon um, about how people are renegotiating our relationship with nature. Um, there's a lot of opportunity to I'm going to stop my video because I, I think it may be slowing down. It's not always fulfilled for everybody. Um, you, people are using open spaces and public lands um, and spending more time outdoors. Time is also an opportunity. Some of you have been able to get work done um, or spend more time to work on data archiving or data analysis, taking the time to redesign field plans. This is an opportunity to find some creative solutions. So building networks to support solutions that can address both the pandemic and climate change. Uh, we might be at the beginning of making a significant difference and um, certainly addressing climate change is an opportunity. And then finally, um, science communication. This is a time for individuals and organizations to be a source for steady, reliable information about science. Um, it's a chance for students and researchers and others to learn how to communicate clearly to separate the science from the politics and that maybe people are a little bit more willing to um, discuss things and that this the time is right to dialogue because a lot of doors have been opened. Most of you, um, your work has been affected both in general and in Acadia. Um, the most common ways it were, was affected was it was altered in some way, like being switched to online. It was shortened. Um, the beginning was delayed or it was postponed until next year. Um, and some work was canceled altogether. 52% of you said that internships or other early career opportunities um, were affected by COVID-19. Another third said they were not affected. Um, some of you weren't sure. And the top ways that they were affected were either being canceled altogether, changed to virtual experiences, shortened or delayed, or just fewer internship offerings. And um, I did put the, the, all the answers to this question in the handout, and it was, it was pretty devastating to read these. And so I think we all have an obligation to figure out how to help um, some of our young professionals because missing a year, um, it's not a big deal when you're, when you're mid-career, but when you're just starting out, um, it, it can be really significant. Um, some of you do plan to apply for permit to do research in Acadia. This wasn't applicable to about a third of our audience, which is actually great. It's so many, it's great to have all the people here um, who aren't actually researchers, but are interested in and supporting of science in Acadia. Um, a third of you will not, a fifth of you will apply to do research. We just wanted to get a sense. Um, some of you are not sure for multiple reasons and some are not sure specifically because of COVID, but that was a very small number. More than half of you have adjusted your work to increase or advocate for equity, inclusion, diversity, and justice. Um, again, I put all of the answers to this question in your handout so you can look through those. Most are what I categorize as policy changes. So this is um, decisions about about hiring or creating internship opportunities um, or actual sort of on paper changes. And then a lot of the other ways were by just including more voices and perspectives in your work and the stories that bear about science and science in Acadia. A lot of you are just learning um, and a lot of you are participating in some kind of committee or work group. Um, and so finally, we have just a few discussion questions. If you have had time to look at the more detailed results of the survey, um, these are some prompt questions if to discussion. Is that correct? Either in the chat, um, definitely submit questions in the chat. Thanks a bunch, Catherine. That was great. And I, um, 
I second Catherine Matassa's comment in there. I think it's really nice to see, or it's, it's helpful to see how everybody's doing to get a sense of the community. Um, uh, and that we're, right, we're not alone um, in what, what, how things are going right now. Um, and so in the interest of time, so we kind of uh, went through, we went through our discussion time. So what we'll do is based on your, um, based on your comments and responses to the, uh, to the survey, we definitely have ideas. Uh, you gave us ideas about what you want in terms of topics to be addressed in discussions and some volunteers even to help um, lead things. And uh, so we will be following up with, uh, with those later on. And we may come back to these prompts as well um, in future discussions. So we will be letting you know um, uh, later this fall about as we develop those schedules, uh, we will keep you up to date on those. Um, and uh, we will also sooner than that, we will send a follow up email to everybody with a list of the attendees who are on here today and uh, or at least those of you who indicated you were willing to share your, your name and contact information and a link to the recording of the science symposium. Um, and including for those who registered, uh, but who couldn't make it. Um, with that, I think uh, I want to really thank all of the speakers uh, for <laughs> helping to make this our and, and the organizers uh, for helping to make this our very first online science symposium that the kickoff of it um, happened today. Um, and, uh, and thank really you for uh, for coming and, and for all that you've done, uh, you are the ones that actually do the research in Acadia and help tell those science stories um, and really make our science uh, community what it is. Um, and we look forward to staying in touch and, and keeping our community healthy and strong going forward. Um, so thank you super, super much. And we will be in touch and talk more soon. Take care and, uh, and have a very good night. Thanks everybody. Have a great week.